It's been said that every quilt tells a story, and it's so true. But I also believe every quilter has a story to tell. I wanted to hear about the people behind these wonderful quilts and thought you'd enjoy hearing about their lives also. Welcome to A Quilter's Life. Carrie Lehman of Appalachia Modern Quilt Company believes everyone has a need to create and she loves to create quilts. I love her attitude of helping other quilters. Her statement that a rising tide lifts all boats, so the more we do to foster the quilting community, the better off we're all going to be, affirms her perspective that we are better when we work together. Carrie, thanks so much for joining me on A Quilter's Life. Thank you. It's absolutely a pleasure to be with you. Let's start with where you were born and raised. So I was born in Marietta, Ohio, and spent the first 18 years of my life in a small college town, Athens, Ohio, where Ohio University lives, and knew that when I graduated high school, I needed to get out and see things beyond a college town. So I moved to Cleveland for college and went to Case Western Reserve University and spent in total about eight years in Northeast Ohio and then moved on to Chicago, where I was for 17 years before the hills of Southeast Ohio called me back. And now I am back at home in my hometown of Athens, Ohio. Wow. Isn't that funny how that can happen? The draw is is pretty visceral. It definitely was a, a pull to come back home. Mm-hmm. I love the hills in Ohio. There's something about, for your listeners, if you've ever been to this part of the country and you know, you're coming southeast from Columbus, Ohio, there's a part of the road on 33 where you start to feel the hills. And it's just something that it's part of who we are. It just is a feeling that you get nowhere else in, in coming home. Uh-huh. I was born and raised in California, but my home is Marietta. So it was exciting to hear you say you were born in Marietta. And I do <laughs> love these hills. Most definitely. Mm-hmm. How about a special childhood memory? Well, growing up, my mother was a home economics teacher. Back in the day, we had home economics in school. And she sewed a lot. And so in learning to sew myself, we discovered that I really wasn't particularly good at creating garments. I was one of those people who no matter how specific the pattern was, and we know they're not always very specific, I would be the one who would sew a sleeve onto a waist or something ridiculous. So that was kind of my early foray into sewing. Lots of encouragement, but I just was no good at garment sewing. Interesting. With not wanting to sew, did you have other activities being a child that you wanted to do or did? I was kind of a bookworm, but, you know, as a child, actually, as I was getting into high school, I discovered art class and I had an amazing teacher. Her name was Judy Morgan, and she explored all sorts of different media and I was able to learn techniques around photography, around silver and metal smithing, and just exploring different ways to express yourself. And one of the things I say to people is I think we as humans all have a need to create. Whatever it is, some people cook, some people you know do silversmithing, some people do jewelry making, some people do soap making, whatever your craft, even gardening, like we all have that innate need to, to work with our hands and create something that becomes, we hope, more beautiful than what we started with. Mm -hmm. So you went off to Case Western. 
did you end up in an employment with your major or or not? Yeah, so I went to Case Western Reserve. I ended up with a bachelor's and a master's of chemical engineering and then went on to complete my MBA. So right out of school, I did go to work for a couple of firms as a research engineer and then on to onto a technical service engineer and I learned very early on that I was not so great in the lab and it wasn't just me. I had some bosses, some supervisors who realized out of the gate, like, okay, the lab is not where you need to be. And over a series of job transitions, I moved from being a research engineer into sales away from the manufacturing industry and more into consulting. And I spent the last, I don't know, probably 20 years of of my corporate career, if you will, in uh, the consulting industry, leading national sales teams. So lots of left turns, started out as an engineer, but didn't stay there for very long. Hmm. But it obviously helped you in your sales. You know, I would not trade my education for anything. In grade school and high school, I was very, very good at math and science, and I didn't really have anybody in my life who was an engineer. So it was kind of a guess that something that would work for me. And I loved it. I absolutely loved the curriculum. I loved all the heavy math. Um, Sometimes it got the better of me. But I think what it really did is taught me how to think taught me how to solve problems, how to peel back the different elements of an issue and figure out what the root cause was and solve that problem. So I think that's the common thread that really takes me through my career and my life is I just love solving problems. You know, it's it's one of those things that I think we all get a, a pretty strong sense of satisfaction by doing. And it's something even in quilting or in my job today that makes it fun is solving problems. Mm -hmm. Well, you said you're back in Athens now. Was -hmm. there something specific that not only drew you back, but you needed to move back for? Well, my family's here. So I moved back and my parents are here. I have cousins here, grandparents here. So that was really the draw is coming and being able to spend more regular time with my family as opposed to just a visit a few days, a few times a year. So that was definitely a pull. But what I realized once I got back, and actually when I came back, I was a bit afraid of it, was living in Cleveland and and in Chicago it was very easy to lead an anonymous, disconnected life. You know, like I would go to the store and never see anybody. It was very, very easy to remain anonymous in a large metropolitan area. And I liked that because I really valued my privacy. And I was afraid in coming to a small town, what kind of an impact that would have on me, on on us. And what's interesting is it took probably a couple of years to really not just get used to it, but really enjoy the fact that it's hard to go anywhere without bumping into someone you know, or just having a random conversation with someone you haven't seen in a little while or somebody that you see every day. And being able to to make a connection with someone very quickly based on somebody else that you mutually know. I know that back in the 90s or 2000s, we all talked about seven degrees of separation and the whole Kevin Bacon game. I think in Athens and probably in any small community, it's more like two degrees of connection. So if you sit and have a five minute conversation with anybody in Athens, probably you can find not just one, but two connections that you have with that person, which is really why I love living in a small community. Mm -hmm. Boy, is that making me think of stories. (laughs) 
(laughs) (laughs) But you also have to know that people probably know who you are that you don't know who they are. (laughs) So you never really know what the chatter is around. But yeah, I just love being in this size of a community. It's really great. Yeah. Besides quilting, are there other crafts you do or have done? Oh, I've dabbled in a lot of different things. I think the one thing that I've dabbled most in other than quilting and sewing is soap making. That's something that that's been enjoyable or, you know, doing small crafts for people at the holidays. I tried mosaics once that did not go well. I also tried knitting and crocheting that also did not go well for someone who's used to starting with, you know, pieces of fabric, you know, taking the time to actually create a piece of fabric was just not my thing. That was kind of a disaster. So anymore, I stick pretty close to quilting and have worked to hopefully master that craft. But at the same time, I tell you what, I think one of the best things about quilting is there's always something new to learn. Like there's a new technique or a new thing to do, a new way to hone your skills. So I'm one of those people who's always looking to improve my mastery of of the craft. Mm -hmm. What about other hobbies? Well, I quilt a lot, so I don't have a ton of time for other hobbies. But probably, I don't know, three or four years ago, my husband and I took a motorcycle writer's course. And by the time of the end of the course, I didn't feel as though I had quite mastered it yet. So that was an important thing for me to feel like I had done. He's ridden motorcycles for a long time, but agreed to do this with me. So I didn't have to do it by myself. And so over the past couple of years, we've each gotten a motorcycle. And when the weather is nice and sunny, I'll do a little tooling around town, but that's about it. Like that's as far as I'll go with the motorcycle. I haven't really gotten brave enough to to take any sort of a long trip. So that's something that we do in the summertime for sure. But in terms of other hobbies, no, nah, I'm pretty much a quilter. Yeah. I was just picturing, I've heard of other people also doing motorcycles and I was just picturing quilters doing a shop hop on the motorcycle. Yeah, I mean, you definitely have to have big saddlebags for that. (laughs) (laughs) But your partner or spouse might really appreciate the the shop hop on a motorcycle because it does limit you in terms of what you're able to purchase along the way. (laughs) Share with me, who introduced you to quilting? I did. It was something that I always kind of thought I would be good at. Again, the math and engineering background and solving problems. And my mom, of course, introduced me to sewing. So it really was me. And it was back in the late 90s, early 2000s, where I just picked up a book and a starter pattern and went to town. To this day, I don't think I've actually taken a quilting class other than my long arming classes. So very much self-taught and have really enjoyed becoming a part of the community with it too. I think that's something that's fun about quilting too. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to have a favorite quilt that either you've made or just a pattern you really love? I am fortunate enough to quilt others quilts. So I see some really amazing work come through my studio. And there are definitely a few that stand out, but I tend to like quilts that are slightly on the modern side, but not too modern and have a really good eye to color and design. But you know what? I don't think I have a single favorite quilt. There are just so many and the community around here just makes such beautiful, beautiful quilts that it would be hard to choose one that is my absolute favorite. Mm -hmm. While you're working on your quilts, is there a tool that you are just so thankful for? I'd have to say my long arm. Her name is Rosie. 
She is a Gamel Statler stitcher. And she's really, you know, like I spend a lot of time with her. We're, we're pretty close. There's so many things I love about Rosie, but most of us who are Gamel owners learn to do our own maintenance. So, you know, there's opportunity to get into the mechanics of it and understand how it works. And the software package that we all use is so sophisticated that again, you know, back to that whole idea of problem solving, there are usually three or four different ways to approach a specific issue within the capability of the machine. So yeah, I would have to say Rosie is my favorite quilting tool. Neat. And also working on their quilts, do you like one part of the process more than others or do you like each step? There are steps, I think, for all of us that we really like and there are steps that we don't really like. Of course, being a long armor, I love quilting. And I love when someone brings me a quilt, being able to, and one of my clients says, read the quilt. So you have time with the quilt and think about it and think about, you know, what are the fabrics like? What kind of motifs are in the fabrics? What does the pattern look like? Really getting a sense of the quilt before you start thinking about, okay, so what kind of a design am I going to use on this quilt? So for me, that's probably the most fun part is working with the piecer, the quilter, in figuring out how we're going to quilt this in a way that that will make their work look even more beautiful. I would say the the part of the process I like least is hand stitching the binding on the back. Like it's just too slow. You know, I talked about knitting earlier. Yeah. Hand stitching the binding on the back. I have a small wall hang that I finished probably, I don't know, three or four months ago. And there are so many other things I would rather do than <laughs> stitch the binding to the back. Binding's on the front. I just have to sit down and literally it'll take me like two or three hours and that'll be it. But I just don't enjoy that part of the process. Wow. It just amazes me. There seems to be two camps. There's nothing in between. You either love oh. it or don't. Yep. Describe your worst quilting experience. Isn't it awful when you start a quilt, you know, you go pick out the fabric, you have a pattern, you start going on it, and you have, I don't know, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours into this quilt. And one day you look at it and you decide, I just don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> this is a quilt I am just never going to love. So I think I'm probably not the only one that has a couple of those in a bin somewhere that you think, well, someday I'll just finish it and give it away. But it's just like shoved off into a corner. So I think that's always a not so fun quilting experience. Aside from that, I think about learning how to long arm and we all make mistakes. Like nothing is perfect and no quilt should be perfect. If it were perfect, it would have been manufactured in a facility probably somewhere other than here. But nothing bugs me more than taking a quilt off the frame and there might be a little tuck in the back. Or I remember sometimes early in my long arming days where a pattern doesn't stitch the way you want it to stitch. And I'll tell you what, stitches go down fast on a long arm. And they come out really slow. <laughs> so <laughs> fortunately, I don't have a, a really tight relationship with my seam ripper anymore. But early on in my long arming days, yeah, uh, we were fast friends. <laughs> Why do you think you make quilts rather than using your time to do something else? Well, we talked earlier about my belief that everybody has a need to create. And I firmly believe that. And so quilting for me satisfies that need. But other things I like about quilting are, it feels like you're making progress on something and you're creating something and you can visually see the progress that you're making. And so I really enjoy that. 
but even more than those two things, I enjoy, you know, my part of the process, which is long arming and being able to connect with other quilters in a way that I get to collaborate on every single one of their quilts. And how cool is that? Like, it's just so much fun to be a part of the story for all of these quilts and be a part of that. How fun in the connections you must have. Yeah. Just the friendships you must be creating with others because of getting to know them over a quilt. That just must be amazing. It is. It's really good. And, you know, I think quilting is, you can think of it both as an individual and a team sport. We all make our own quilts. Most of us have a place in our home where we work to create our quilts and it's a good way to spend your your personal time, your solo time. And so for someone like me who is kind of an introvert, it's a really good way to express yourself. But at the same time, it can be a team sport in that you are going to collaborate with others. You know, whether you go on retreats or sit through quilt classes or do open sews with people, or you work with the long armor or other people on your quilts, having that kind of connection, as you say, over a quilt and over the creation of this beautiful, what will be an heirloom is amazing. And it's fun because we have something to talk about that's in common. We don't have to let any of the noise of our world come into the conversation And we can literally just talk about a quilt. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. When you have the opportunity to work on your own quilt, who are you making them for? Sometimes I have a plan and sometimes I don't. Sometimes it's we have a new baby on the way. And so you want to give a special welcome gift. Sometimes I'll make a quilt or I'll get a quilt together and... As you're making it, it kind of tells you who it's for. And I don't know how to explain that, but, you know, you get midway through the quilt and it's like, okay, this one's for so-and-so. So So oftentimes I don't have a plan at all. Like when I'm making a big quilt, I usually don't have a plan at all. But by the time I get partway through it, there might be a plan for it and where it needs to go. So I kind of let the quilt tell me, unless it's for a specific gift. That's so interesting. I know others have said that to me, but I haven't experienced that myself. So hopefully I'll get there one day just to be able to make a (laughs) quilt to make a quilt. But it seems like right now it's always for a specific person. So that that's really interesting. Are you working on something right now? There's always something going. I and always, you know, multiple things in different stages of completion. I've got a block of the month going from about two years ago. (laughs) So, you know, block of every other month, every three months. I'm always working on some sort of skill builder. So I've got a quilt going that I'm going to work on specific long arming skills around that pieced quilt. And I've got at least two of my own quilts hanging in the queue to be long armed, one of which I should just get it up on the frame and get it done. The other is a beautiful starburst pattern done on the diagonal with a white background and rainbow colored batiks. And it's one that requires a lot of thought in how to long arm it. And so it's been hanging in the closet for about a year because I just haven't stared at it long enough and been willing to make the commitment of how am I actually going to going to quilt this Mm -hmm. so is that kind of a heavy feeling on you not knowing what you're going to do with it or it's fine just to hang there until that comes about that one feels like a big decision so sometimes, you know, the other one I mentioned, probably just need to get it on the get it on the frame and get it done. That one just feels like a really big decision. And 
once you commit, you're going in that direction. So I just haven't gotten to a place yet where I'm willing to commit to that direction. So it's going to require just some focused thought and exploration on how I want to get that one done. Share a quilting tip. Sure. So coming from a long armor's point of view, I talk to people a good bit about choosing backing fabric. And one of the things that I tell people is think about the thread color that you want to use on the top. So if you have a quilt that has a very strong white background, I would strongly advise you against choosing a backing fabric that is a a really deep color, like a navy blue or something that is a high contrast to that top. And the reason is that when I'm quilting, in an ideal world, I like to use the same color in the top thread and the bobbin thread, but that's not usually how it works. So I at least like to use thread in the top and the bobbin that are of similar value so that you don't see one through the other. You know, so if you have a white top and a navy blue, it's likely that you're going to see the shadow or a poke of a navy blue thread on the top. So always think about your top thread color that you want to use when you're picking your backing fabric. Interesting. That could save someone a lot of grief. Mm Mm-hmm. Describe how you went from having quilting as a hobby to it becoming a business. Back in, I would say, the early 2000s, I was spending more and more time quilting, but I was doing all of my own quilting on a domestic machine. And to me, that really extended the time it took to finish a quilt. Like it was much harder to get quilts done. And I felt really limited in what I was able to do with my domestic. I wasn't able to do the things that I want. So at a quilt festival, a quilt show, I started looking, you know, you you always kind of think like, oh, it'd be really nice to have a long arm. I started looking at long arms and just took the leap. It's kind of one of those of, I had a really good year in my career and got a really nice bonus and I could have bought a car, but instead I bought a long arm and that's kind of the decision that I made. And when I bought the long arm at that time, it wasn't necessarily to be a business, but I bought the one that I bought with that in mind that it could be at some point. When we moved back to Ohio, I started having a little bit more control of my time in the evenings and on weekends and just decided to put it out there and started talking to people of, Hey, you know, what's the long arming market like here in the area? And before I knew it, I had a really steady business and I don't think I've had a lull in the business for two or three years now, which has been really, really great. I usually have a queue of quilts waiting for me. I've probably got I don't know, six or eight in the queue right now. And it's just been amazing to be able to start that up and build those connections. Fun. And what's the name of the business and how did you come up with this name? It's Appalachia Modern. And I thought about it for a really long time. And it's kind of one of those that you just kind of roll over words and feelings in your mind of, what you want to be. And I've always had a bit of a bent toward modern design, but not crazy modern, you know, like not really, really out there modern, but just a a bent toward modern. And that juxtaposition with how people think about Appalachia and being close to the core and being grassroots, being community, being you know, everything that Appalachia is, it just felt like the right combination for me of what I do and who I am and what this business is about. And when did you actually 
open Appalachia Modern Quilt Company? I want to say early 2019. So I think I'm going into my third full year. Wow. Here in Athens. Yep. I think you covered this question a little bit. I have, how did you start professionally quilting for others? You mentioned you started asking others. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I did was I went to the local quilt shops and spent some time with the owners. And most quilt shops, of course, have, I shouldn't say most, many quilt shops have a long arm service on site. And so I wanted to make myself known to them. You know, I've always approached it as the rising tide lifts all boats. So the more we're all doing to foster the quilting community, the better off we're all going to be. So I would approach local quilt shops and ask them, hey, I'm doing some long arming. I'm getting started. I'm offering some introductory prices. And again, I'm not interested in taking business from you, but if you have something that you don't want to do or you're too busy or you're backlogged or somebody needs a fast turnaround, you know, something that you aren't able to accommodate, I would really appreciate it if you gave them my card. So really building those relationships with local quilt shops. So that was a really important start for me in in getting going. Also, there were a couple of shows or events that I did just to get my name out there. There's a what used to be called the Quilt Fest and then the Stitch Fest. And and this year, it'll be called the Southern Ohio Fiber Arts Fest. Getting involved with those shows or organizations to start building relationships was really helpful, too. And like many people, I started a business on Etsy. And that's been something that has been so interesting. I've done quilts for people really all across the country. I've done quilts for people in Hawaii and California and New York and Virginia and Florida. That's been so much fun to have that business going as well. So, you know, just a few different ways that I've worked to get my name out there and build relationships. And of course, my clients have been amazing to me in making referrals. So I so appreciate them doing that and continuing to bring me more quilts. So it's really fabulous. One of the things that we started doing actually just recently is a friend of mine has a bed and breakfast nearby. It's called Bobcat Bed and Breakfast and it's on a farm. And The barn on the farm has been restored and it's absolutely outstanding. So we've started to do open sows in the barn. So again, supporting the quilting community, bringing people together. It's more than just the quilting. It really is about bringing people together and creating together. How fun. It's not quite a quilt retreat, but it's just a day that they can come and quilt. Mm Mm-hmm. I think we'll probably get to the place where folks will come on their own and do quilt retreats at the bed and breakfast and, you know, be able to have the open sew in the, in the barn. But we're just kind of getting started with that. And she has a lot of other things in the barn. So it's kind of another fun way to, to grow the community. Yeah. Cool. Can you tell me about the time when someone first brought you their quilt? And that feeling you had getting that first quilt to do? Uh, Terror. (laughs) (laughs) You know, of course, you're excited to be working on somebody's quilt. But there's a bit of terror involved, too, in knowing that this is somebody's quilt. Making sure that you are doing it in a way that they're going to like. And it's good. And you don't make any mistakes. And so... It's putting all of the skills to use that you've developed over the years. I've taken lots of long arming courses and gone to conferences. And again, I continue to build my own skills. But when you're working on somebody else's quilt, you have that moment where you're like, oh, you can't screw this up. You really have to 
<laughs> you have to do a good job. So I would say that was kind of that first, like, it's just that blend of excitement and terror. <laughs> do you remember <laughs> how that first one turned out? It was great. Good. Yeah. The client was happy and she's brought me lots of quilts. So it's worked out quite well. Great. And share with me where we can go to find more about Appalachia Modern Quilt Company. Sure. So you can find me on Facebook and it is facebook.com forward slash Appalachia Modern. You can like my page. You can message me on Facebook. That's probably the easiest way to reach me. Or you can always give me a call. I'm happy to talk about your quilt. Happy to talk about what you would like to work on. So you can always give me a call. And my phone number is 740-517-5614. Great. Is there anything else you wanted to share with me? It's just been an absolute pleasure. And I'm so glad to find your podcast and help us all build this community. It's such a special group of people and the craft that we have all developed is an important one for so many reasons, but most importantly, because of the community. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me. It's been a delight. Thank you. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. You can find more stories on aquilterslife.com or subscribe on your favorite podcast player so each episode will be downloaded automatically. Also, I want to hear about you and your wonderful quilts. Please contact me, Paula Chamberlain, through the website to set up an interview. And as always, thanks for listening.